The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the SFL webinar series. My name is Leah Palagashvili, and I'm the director of the SFL webinar series and an executive board member of SFL. We are honored to have Professor Henry Manny deliver a talk tonight on why our universities are so bad. Before we begin, though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Students for Liberty and the webinar series. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization run by students and for students dedicated to liberty. We were formed four years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche in our universities, connecting liberty-friendly students with other students, faculty, organizations, and resources to help them advance their ideas and applications of classical liberalism. The resources we offer include free books for student groups, a speaker's network, protest grants, handbooks on running a student organization, tabling kits, leadership training, an academic journal for liberty and society, and our bread and butter conferences. The SFL webinar series is our way of giving you access to the ideas and mentorship and webinars each week to free. For a full list, please visit our website, Students Professor Henry Manny. Henry Manny served as a dean of the George Mason School of Law from 1986 to 1996. Professor Manny is an honorary life member of the American Law and Economics Association, which honored him as one of the four founders of the field of law and economics. He launched the Law and Economics Center at Emory University and the University of Miami before bringing it to George Mason University. His writings include such influential works as Insider Trading in the Stock Market, Wall Street in Transition, and Mergers and the Market for Corporate Control. Professor Manny holds a BA from Vanderbilt University, JD from the University of Chicago, JSD from Yale University, LLD from Seattle University, and LLD from the University of Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala. Just to note, there will be about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. Feel free to type in any questions into the question box. For those interested, this webinar will be recorded and archived on our website in the next few weeks. We'll be sending you more detailed information about Students for Liberty and our upcoming webinars in the follow-up email. And without further ado, I present to you Professor Manny. Thank you. The title of my talk tonight, uh, Why Are Universities So Bad?, sometimes raises eyebrows. A lot of people don't even know that universities are so bad. And indeed, some of them are not so bad, and some areas are not bad at all. But on balance, uh, by, uh, if judged simply by the criticism slowing today, we'd have to say there are some real problems with higher education in this country. Uh, the complaints so most commonly relate to the costs involved. Uh, sometimes, uh, and perhaps more correctly, to the absence of real education being done. Uh, sometimes there are complaints that uh, the uh, students uh, don't work hard enough, uh, that uh, the administration is bloated. But the most common complaint one hears is that of tenure for the professors. And that is most people's explanation of, of their complaints about uh, what's wrong with universities. Well, I'm here to say that tenure is simply a symptom of a much more profound uh, problem with universities, and that is the absence of private property rights. Uh, that's what I'm going to explain, and it's a fascinating subject that carries us into some very arcane legal history uh, and through some rather astounding American history to a full understanding of what we've come to today and why. <clears throat> My story really begins with Henry VIII, the Tudor king in England in the uh, uh, late uh, 15th century. Uh, he, he was the king of many wives and a couple of whom he beheaded. His first wife, however, was Catherine of Aragon, uh, who had a pretty strong claim to the English throne herself, uh, <clears throat> but she couldn't deliver him a male heir. Now, whether that was a requirement under the line of the rules of succession or not is not clear, but he wanted a male heir, so he wanted to get rid of Catherine, and he hadn't yet, or perhaps politically couldn't hit on the uh, solution of cutting her head off, so he simply appealed to the Pope of the Catholic Church in Rome, 
uh, to give him an annulment. There was only one problem standing in his way. The Pope was Catherine's first cousin, and he preferred her position to his and would not grant the annulment. Well, Henry was not to be uh, undone by this. Uh, he was a pretty strong-willed fellow, and so he simply disestablished the Catholic Church in England, replacing it with what came to be known as the Church of England or the Anglican Church. Now, that seems to have very little to do with higher education, but in fact it had a great deal to do with it. Because uh, <clears throat> two things. One was the only two universities that existed then in England were Cambridge and Oxford. They were branches of the Catholic Church prior to disestablishment, and presumably uh, when a new church was established, they became branches of that. Uh, <clears throat> however, there was a rule of common law, a very old one, that caused some considerable problems. It was known as the rule against perpetuities. Oh, it's been the uh, bane of the existence of first-year law school students for a long time. But it had a very, very special economic consequence. The rule against perpetuity said that you couldn't tie up property forever. I won't, I won't go into any detail on that, but it, in effect, guaranteed that property after a certain period of time would come back onto the market and its use would be tested by the market. It, as the economists are wont to say, uh, it would go to the highest valued user. If you had, uh, as the previous Catholic Church had enjoyed, an exception to the rule against perpetuities, you could accept property in perpetuity. Uh, it was a recognized exception under the common law for the Catholic Church, the established church. Also uh, it applied to the king, the crown. Uh, consequently, when Henry disestablished the church, the universities no longer had a lot of the privileges that they had enjoyed under the old common law exception to the rule against perpetuities. The principal form of wealth in the 15th century and a long time before and after, for that matter, was land. And the principal way of supporting the universities or many branches of the church, for that matter, monasteries, orphanages, hospitals, was to donate land. But if you couldn't donate the land in perpetuity, it meant that after some period of time, I won't go into those details, the title to the land would revert to someone else. Well, you can imagine that that was a cause of considerable consternation in the universities. Uh, not merely the universities, but other of uh, uh, Elimocenary institutions as well that had been part of the Catholic Church and which had lost their exemption from the rule against perpetuities. Some years later, close to over 60 years later, under the reign of Elizabeth I, Henry's daughter, but with two intervening uh, regents, Parliament adopted a rule, uh, excuse me, a law, a statute known as the Statute of Charitable Uses. Basically what it did was reestablish that old exception to the common law rule against perpetuities for anything that was set up for charitable purposes. They expressly mentioned educational purposes, but there were uh, other things as well. What it meant was that, <clears throat> that uh, these organizations could hold property in perpetuity. There were, there were some other uh, benefits to it uh, as well, uh, privileges in relation to taxes and other things. At any rate, that statute uh, became uh, so generally well accepted that it became for the American colonies a part of the British common law. We didn't view it as a statute. Now the British common law was simply adopted by each of the colonies in the United States and by indirection that, uh, that uh, condition continued after the adoption of our Constitution in 1784, 1787. The, uh, <coughs> The uh, 
uh, idea of a charitable purpose is ha has some economic consequences. Uh, the principal one, university mess, is a problem of property rights to a charity exchange. In other words, what does that mean? Well, it has some uh, motivational uh, consequences. It means that the people running, uh, people managing the property, aren't going to be very well motivated to increase its value uh, because they can't capture that value. <clears throat> they need to be motivated by something else for a charity to work at all. Charitable motive is usually what we think of in this connection. But that wasn't the reason that our early colleges in the colonies, and there were nine uh, colleges in the colonies before the uh, revolution, uh, <clears throat> it didn't mean that uh, they were all established with the idea of uh, a charitable purpose, social welfare, uh, being uh, contributing money for the benefit of the young people everywhere. That wasn't the idea at all. The motive that kept those things going was religion. Not one of those nine colleges that existed in the college, a religious organization. Uh, most of the colonies at that time, at least about half of them, had established churches. Now, we, we tend to think of uh, the United States like having a national law history. Uh, <clears throat> the economy of the tremendous rush of people for the cheap or even free land west of the Allegheny Mountains, a vast migration of people uh, who settled areas of Ohio, the entire Midwest is the period we're talking about. They were very religious people. It's hard for us to imagine today, uh, oh, without uh, examples like uh, Muslim fundamentalists, uh, perhaps some born-again Christians in the United States, uh, perhaps some very Orthodox Jews. It's very hard for us to understand that almost the entire population at that time was still imbued that strongly with a sense of religion. So as this population uh, moved to the west of the Alleghenies, they had a concern about uh, education of their children in religious matters. Uh, they needed churches, and to have churches, you had to have ministers. Most of the hundreds of private schools that were started in the Midwest in the period after the American Revolution and up to the Civil War, um, I, not most of them, I think uh, I don't really know of that period if there is any exception to a school that was started uh, without some religious connection. Their motivation was very clear. Uh, they wanted to train ministers. That was first and foremost. They wanted to educate uh, the children who would be their community leaders uh, in religious values. And to the extent that some of the schools were either uh, uh, schools, so they had both sexes represented, uh, they were also marriage markets to make sure their kids were educated within the church. Now, just to flip back to the East Coast for a moment, there was one school started in this period that doesn't, it's an exception that many people know about, but then we're going to leave it because it doesn't have any influence on the further development of the higher education in the United States. That's the University of Virginia. It was started by Thomas Jefferson, who was uh, almost an atheist, certainly an agnostic. Uh, it was uh, largely a secular school, but it was designed for something that those seven schools I mentioned as existing in the colony, several, several of which were the original Ivy League schools, and the, the elite schools of then and now, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, all started as religious schools. But they moved away from that. They uh, early on uh, became more secular. This, after all, was a period when the scientific revolution, the reformation, uh, was all beginning to uh, have some impact on society. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, people running those schools simply weren't as fundamentally religious as the ones as schools being started in the Midwest. Uh, <clears throat> Now, 
they did something else to my point, that if you have a religious orientation and motivation, uh, even a nonprofit organization may be fairly well run. It may be run simply to gain whatever you want, production of ministers, production of a certain kind of education, but you want it done most efficiently. You want it at the least possible cost for what it is that you're producing. The East Coast schools became uh, something different, but it borrows on the same economics. The education of the basic aristocracy in this country, uh, we don't even, uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, at that time, there was a, a sense that there were some people cut out to run things. Uh, and those schools became, like the University of Virginia, schools to educate people for community leadership, for uh, the jobs of the elite. Uh, okay. <clears throat> There were three main and it was true now. First of all is who gets taught? Uh, <clears throat> what gets taught? Who gets admitted? After all, this has to be subsidized or you'd have a market you know, working and they didn't want a market. You didn't want uh, consumer sovereignty uh, because you, you were producing something for yourself. That is the people who put up funds for these things. Uh, they weren't offering a, uh, education competitively on a market. So nothing like consumer sovereignty could operate, and you didn't have that kind of a market for education. Uh, <clears throat> so that they had to decide who would be allowed in uh, with this subsidy, financial subsidy that would be given. And third, very important, who would be allowed to teach maybe to administer and teach what uh, is decided of three of the rules, uh, you, and particularly I'm talking now about these uh, huge number of small Midwestern uh, private uh, denominational colleges, uh, of which many are still around, but for reasons we'll see later, most of them disappeared. Uh, if you look at uh, ministers of the, of the people, they were at least leaders of the church community, and how did they run the school? They ran it. Uh, they decided, based on their religious denominational ideology, uh, doctrine, what would be taught. They decided which young people would be admitted to this benefit, and they had very strict rules about who could teach. Uh, they would have liked religious ministers doing teaching, and of course many did. Uh, <clears throat> they couldn't always uh, manage that. Uh, they uh, uh, they admitted generally uh, children only. <clears throat> there was uh, there wasn't much demand from anyone else, but that was uh, nonetheless uh, controlled. Uh, and what was taught was specifically uh, and carefully uh, uh, monitored by the trustees. Now, how would these an uh, organization of this sort be managed? Well, the trustees wouldn't do it themselves. There are people of, uh, who had regular day jobs, as we'd say today. Uh, <clears throat> nonetheless, they would want to hire as the administrator someone who was full. And so you, as a consequence, you find uh, the presidents being very much of a mind of the religious uh, orientation. Presidents were very often uh, or ordained people, uh, <clears throat> and the presidents with the oversight of the board determined who got hired to teach. And you can be sure there was no such doctrine as academic freedom or uh, choosing uh, to write your own syllabus for your course. They wrote the syllabus. They hired people merely to convey that doctrine to the students. That was the setup. Uh, there's one further thing I should say. And that was that in this period, there was a very strong notion that college students were still very young people, and that this was a transitional period, and the college had some considerable uh, responsibility for, uh, for their behavior. Uh, consequently, had the notion of in loco parentis. Uh, that lasted well into the 1940s, even 50s where you had uh, rules about uh, attendance at uh, religious services, uh, dress codes of sorts, many things of that sort. 
was a, a part of the college life. It was, uh, it was not what you would call a libertarian institution. Uh, it wasn't intended to be. Uh, <clears throat> anyone could start it, uh, any denomination could, and the diversity was enormous. On the East Coast, in those elite schools, something very similar was going on with the sense that was understood by the trustees, the president, and the faculty that these were aristocratic, elitist institutions, that the students who would be admitted to them were the students of the children of the uh, business or political or social aristocracy. Uh, they weren't, weren't democratic in anything like the sense that we know of today. Uh, <clears throat> and very much, uh, very much the same sort of thing applied uh, in the governance of those universities as the smaller schools in the Midwest. The main difference was that uh, the ones in the East developed a kind of social panache that uh, the smaller, uh, more diffuse located uh, schools uh, in the Midwest did not. <clears throat> that was the situation that existed with higher education in the United States up to the time of the Civil War. There were maybe one or two, maybe three or four, I don't know. I've seen reference to two uh, state institutions of higher uh, education. Uh, unlike the University of Virginia, uh, they were uh, uh, much more vocationally oriented, uh, they weren't very important. Um, as I said, there were only two of them. I know one was uh, in Illinois, and I can't even remember where the other one was. <clears throat> but something else was true at that time. Now, we step aside from education to look at the country that existed in 1860. Most people don't realize that by 1860, the United States was probably perhaps the richest country in the world, certainly uh, not far below second or third. Uh, England may have been richer. Uh, Germany hadn't really uh, developed yet. France was still quite rich, but uh, uh, we, had, we had surpassed it. So it was an enormously rich country. At the beginning of the Civil War, there were over 60,000 miles of railroad tracks throughout the United States. Uh, there were bridges. Uh, I presume there were some sizable dams, there was a network of canals, uh, there was the beginning of uh, industrialization on the scale that uh, had already occurred in England and made them much wealthier, but industrialization was certainly well underway in the United States in 1860. Now think about that. No schools of higher education other than these religious or socially elite uh, uh, colleges that I mentioned, and yet we were so rich and so productive and so advanced industrially, how in the world could that have happened? You don't get an economy like that without architects, engineers, chemists, uh, accountants, uh, insurance industry, uh, uh, complex banking, uh, many, many uh, complex fields of endeavor. And yet, how did we train those people? Well, that's one of the black holes of American history on education. I've uh, combed quite a few books now, and I find occasional references to the fact that the apprenticeship system uh, was commonly used for the training. We know that was true with uh, overwhelmingly still with law, uh, uh, somewhat less so, but still true with uh, medicine. Uh, it's hard to believe that uh, we had the industrial uh, level we did uh, using a primitive system of apprenticeship. The odds are very, very high, and I do not have the uh, evidence to give you right now for this. I hope someone will do some historical research on this. Evan, the, uh, the uh, logic of it suggests that there was an enormous proprietary private higher education system flourishing in the United States in 1860. Training engineers, scientists, architects, uh, all manner of people who were needed for a complex modern economy. 
You never hear about that. Uh, you've never even heard the question raised. Where did they get the engineers to build those railroads and those big bridges and uh, all the things we had? Uh, the cities we built even required uh, some higher technology. Uh, it didn't come out of uh, the Harvard and Yale of the day because they weren't interested in teaching that sort of thing. Certainly didn't come out of these religious uh, small colleges throughout the Midwest. There's only one place they could have come, and that was from the private sector. Now, apprenticeship can uh, blur into uh, uh, some form of, of uh, firms. Uh, the only case we actually know of this is relates to uh, law. The first law school in the United States was started because one lawyer in New York City became very popular to have young aspiring lawyers apprentice with him. And he began charging the parents of those aspiring lawyers uh, to be his apprentice. And he realized that he could do it on a wholesale scale, and he started something called the Litchfield School in Litchfield, Connecticut, which was the first formal law school in the United States, purely proprietary. The guy ran it, uh, probably made a pretty good living at it. Uh, <clears throat> that's the one case that I know of, and yet I'm sure something, something similar must have been going on in other fields uh, and, and professions. All of that I've had to say up to now comes to a screeching halt almost with something that is uh, well known in educational history, um, but its place in the context of what I'm talking about is not well understood at all. And I have reference to the passage by Congress in 1861, signed by Lincoln right in the middle of the Civil War of the famous Morrill Act. The first one in 1861, the second one in 1880s, uh, I believe. Uh, <clears throat> that gave away 17 million acres of federally owned land to allow the formation of universities of what they called agriculture and mechanics. There were three conditions attached to any uh, state uh, getting money for these land-grant schools. One, they had to have a school of agriculture. Uh, and that's, that's interesting because the scientific work in agriculture had, uh, had moved considerably, yet we know nothing about the earlier educational history in that field. They also had to have training in the mechanical arts, what we call engineering. <clears throat> they got off to a slow start, but uh, we all know today, every state university with the word state following the state's name uh, is a land-grant school. And there are many schools that uh, are land-grant that uh, people aren't even aware of. Cornell, for instance, uh, was a uh, private university, an Ivy League school as we think of it today. But the larger part of Cornell University is the Cornell School of Agriculture. A uh, very well-known scientific school. It was a land-grant school. <clears throat> city colleges in New York City, uh, I think CCNY or maybe City University, uh, <clears throat> were eligible for land grants. But it was peculiar. Under the bill, the, and most of them got it, federally owned land in the state in which the school was located. So happened that the federal government had very little federal land in the state of New York. And so the uh, New York City University that got the land grant was allowed to pick, and they picked, I think, something like uh, 180,000 acres of prime timber land in Wisconsin, which they proceeded to do years and years to come downriver from the Mississippi. But that's a whole other story. Uh, <clears throat> now, these are government institutions. Uh, they sprung up because that was a big gift, and, and any state was not going to pass it up. The early act, of course, the uh, South in the middle of the Civil War wasn't eligible for, but all the other states grabbed that land as fast as they could and set up some semblance of a land-grant uh, university. The, story, the position of the South is interesting. Uh, <clears throat> the senator uh, wasn't originally Morrell, but someone else, uh, who had pushed this bill for some years, 
had always found resistance from the Southern members of the Senate and the House of Representatives. They did not want to make this, uh, whether it was the giveaway of land or whether it was the democratization of education, I don't know the background, the South resistors that uh, they successfully did. And that's why one of the first things that happened after uh, succession of the Southern states and the Civil War was the passage of the Morrill Act. Uh, Morrill was a senator from Vermont who I think had advocated this earlier, but the uh, name got attached to it later. <coughs> Now, notice what happens. We've got now, in effect, very large-scale, free higher education. It's heavily vocational. It cannot be aimed at tra training ministers because of the First Amendment. Uh, <clears throat> it has to be, uh, all of the uh, other requirement was that any land-grant school had to offer military training. Uh, that's why ROTC schools are, are, are mostly found in land-grant, ROTC programs are mostly found in land-grant colleges. Uh, <clears throat> so there were right off the bat some very significant differences. Perhaps the uh, biggest difference was the first thing I mentioned, that these schools uh, from the beginning obviously became a subject of political interest. Uh, politicians were interested because the voters were interested. The voters were interested because it was free education for their children instead of paying the uh, exorbitant rates that uh, those uh, uh, private schools were asking. Uh, and so this underwrote them. That's uh, one of the reasons why the bill passed. Uh, <clears throat> the politicians took an interest in it. And the question then is, What's the mission of such a school? Those religious schools I've mentioned earlier, the mission is very clear, and I've described it. The elite Eastern sermon, the form of education, which was generally the Eastern schools, liberal arts courses or Western civilization programs, they're almost gone. Uh, <clears throat> that was not what the vast number of voters were after for their children. They wanted them to be able to make a living. Chances are, uh, then, as now, parents and their children aspired for them to get into some well-trained and well-paid profession, and there were plenty of opportunities as long as they'd pay to do that for their children, whether it was uh, paying to get the child into an apprentice program or whether there really were formal schools that uh, we just don't know about, uh, it still cost them. And here was an opportunity for vocational training on the free, at least out of the, out of the tax revenues. <clears throat> Let's look at the three main aspects of uh, university governance and see how land-grant schools, state universities, had to change from what dominated in higher education previously. First of all, uh, what got taught? Couldn't be religious doctrine. Uh, that was banned by the First Amendment if these were state universities. You couldn't indoctrinate in any particular religion. You could teach about religion. You could have courses about the history of religion, comparative religion, and so forth. But you couldn't try and indoctrinate in the religion. Second, who got admitted? Well, <clears throat> that was, uh, there's been a lot of change in that. But uh, by and large, from the beginning, uh, you couldn't have a religious test. That would have been uh, unconstitutional. You didn't have much of a wealth test, uh, a market test, because uh, these schools were very heavily subsidized, although you still had opportunity costs in the time you spent in the university. Uh, <clears throat> at any rate, uh, you've got a much greater democratization of the admissions programs. <clears throat> You had that some way of rationing, however, and they, since they didn't use market price, for many, many years, the only thing that the people who ran these universities could think of as a way of rationing the places they had, because if, if it was open to everybody, uh, it would just uh, flood them. Uh, and, and there have been a few attempts to do that, and it didn't work very well. At any rate, we developed the idea that uh, uh, intelligence should be a test for admission. 
And indeed, that was what was used for, oh, I guess 60 or 70 years after the Morrill Act. It had not been a test in any schools prior to the Morrill Act. It emerged because you had to, you had to have some way of rationing admissions, and that was the standard that uh, made most sense to use. And I might say it was also the, the uh, standard that the faculty liked the best because it's more, uh, much more enjoyable uh, and easy life if you have bright students than if they're not so bright or not well motivated. Third thing, who could teach? Well, again, you couldn't have a religious test. Uh, you couldn't say uh, we only hire uh, Episcopalians or Methodists or Baptists or Catholics or whatever. Not in the state university you couldn't. All of a sudden, you had an enormous competition, comp of this notion later, uh, <clears throat> a religious calling to go teach in one of those schools. Uh, now it became something else. Now it began to be seen as a vocation. Competition was, uh, it was uh, intense for these positions, and it was open to having whites. Now there was a big story later Morrill Acts, one that were separate land-grant schools were upheld in Plessy v. Ferguson on the grounds that that would be some a proposition. <clears throat> now, when you got that market for teachers and you got heavily subsidized admission for students and uh, a, a much broader range of admissibility of students, what effect would that have on those throughout the Midwest and a lot of them in the East as well. In wholesale numbers, they disappeared overnight. They couldn't stand the competition. Uh, it, it wasn't merely that people wouldn't uh, contribute as much to them, uh, even if they would. They couldn't subsidize as much to the students who were after vocational training in Maine uh, as uh, these new schools could. And so the older pattern of education was nearly decimated. There were remnants of it. Uh, the, uh, the, and certainly a number of the private schools survived. Uh, they survived for a variety of reasons. One, they started moving themselves into, and at a very high level, into vocational work in law, in medicine, in architecture, uh, in engineering. Uh, and you, MIT, incidentally, was a uh, land grant school. Uh, but uh, Yale and Harvard, at that, at that time in history, in the mid-19th century, had to get into those things or they probably wouldn't have survived. They got into it uh, for various reasons. Uh, they were very good at it, uh, and they survived. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, my guess is that something like maybe 15%, 15, maybe 20% on, I don't think it was nearly that high, of the huge number of uh, small denominational schools in the Midwest survived. Now, they changed too. Uh, remember, you now have something that attracts the students away from their religious uh, orientation at a time when that was going on on a much grander scale throughout society. The early relig religiosity that uh, characterized American society in the, uh, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, up to the middle of the 19th century was fast disappearing. Uh, there was a new fallen interest in science and rational uh, 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 approaches to issues, uh, almost uh, a purely secular kind of uh, intellectual interest. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> what that meant was that the trustees who previously ran those religious-oriented schools because of their religious hold on their own mentality and motivation began to disappear. It disappeared first in the Eastern schools. And so you no longer had so many religious tests. You began to get uh, well, quotas for minority religious groups. That was thought, they're thought to be terrible to have a quota for Jews or Catholics in uh, Princeton or Harvard. In fact, often those quotas were a liberalization of their old rules, which were much stricter. At any rate, the, uh, 
the fact that religion lost its hold also meant that these schools began to lose their sense of mission. What is it they were supposed to do? Many of them turned uh, to a copy of the elite schools in the East and specialized in liberal arts education. That's still uh, very much characteristic of many of those smaller schools that have survived in the Midwest. I see I'm running out of time. That often happens. Let me uh, wind up and uh, get to some of the questions. Uh, <clears throat> As the trustees began to lose interest and lose power, the administration no longer had to uh, uh, to toe the line to the trustees' preferences, who was going to move? There was now a, a vacuum in government. There was no one really declaring what the mission was, who was going to be admitted, what was going to be taught, who would be hired. The trustees gave up. They didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, <clears throat> who did? The students didn't. Their parents didn't. The churches were out of it now. There was only one group, and they moved into that vacuum with a vengeance, and that was the faculty. Now, it took a long time for this to develop between 1861 and 1915 when we get the uh, formation of the American Association of University Professors. That's really the first uh, indication that we had something like a trade union among professors in universities. And indeed, many of their arguments have paralleled exactly those trade unions, including tenure in their position, higher salaries, lower, uh, shorter working hours. Uh, they certainly abuse that one. Uh, and that's what happened. The faculties took over. We began to have something like the worker-managed enterprises of Yugoslav communist Yugoslavia in the 19, uh, late 40s and 50s owned the factory, and they ran it. Well, of course, you can imagine what happened. It ran into the ground. It's not a viable system of management. It won't work. Why did the universities survive? They survived, you can thank Henry VIII, perhaps, because they were nonprofit institutions that could exist in perpetuity, or they were government, and stop the development with that the last analysis, apart from mentioning just one more factor. The outline that I gave of modern university governance run by the faculties, and it explains a vast number of the uh, phenomena of higher education today, uh, <clears throat> began to change a little bit in the 1990s when uh, we first got the Stafford Act of uh, federal loans and large numbers of programs subsidizing all manner of universities, private and public. Uh, <clears throat> That meant that the administration now had some controls independent of the faculty. And that probably explains better than anything else the explosion in the administrative uh, personnel of universities. Uh, that's where the uh, huge increase in costs in universities in recent years has gone. It hasn't been an increase in faculty or faculty salaries. It's been in the administrative side. They worked out a peaceful arrangement with the faculty, because the faculty learned how to get rid of presidents they didn't like. The agreement was the president could run this big bureaucracy, and whatever jollies he got, he or she got from doing that, as long as the faculty could continue running the important issues of educational governance. And they have. And it's a mess. And I'll stop there and be happy to hear questions. Okay, thank you, Professor Manny. Um, for all the participants, feel free to type in any questions into the question box um, on your GoToWebinar control panel. And we have a first question. Um, the participant asks, why is it that the Ivy League schools are only in the North? Is this due to the Civil War? Why well, are they, I had couldn't hear you, are they only what? I'm sorry, I'll repeat the question. Why is it that the Ivy League schools are only in the North? Is this due to the Civil War? Well, in, uh, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I was, I was about to say the North was certainly much wealthier 
and uh, the business and wealth elite certainly supported those universities. But the southern states weren't poor. Uh, then there was some degree of industrialization in the South as well, obviously. They fought a, an expensive war. Uh, though they lost, they certainly weren't a, a primitive society. Uh, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Uh, the uh, southern planters, the social elite in the South, in the antebellum South, sent their children to the Ivy League schools for education. Uh, I believe that it was simply a recognition that these were elitist schools uh, uh, training people to be kind of uh, New World aristocrats. And that, uh, but why there were none of those schools, with the possible exception of the University of Virginia, in the South, I really don't know. Okay, our next question. Um, what do you see uh, as the future for universities? Are there reasons to suspect that either private or public universities will dominate? Well, if you listen carefully, uh, you heard that uh, I didn't think there was a great deal of difference in the governance of private and public universities. Uh, the, uh, they tend to look very much alike. They tend to behave very much alike. Certainly, the, uh, a lot of the culture of the uh, original uh, land-grant state universities was borrowed from the uh, predecessors. Uh, I, don't, I see that the problem with both of them is that no one has private property that they can exchange. Consequently, no one is really motivated to make them very good. You don't have a competitive market for education in this country. Now, it's slightly, uh, I, I shouldn't say none, there are some degrees of competition. There's certainly competition among schools for better students, for better professors, uh, as measured by some peculiar standards, not perhaps the standards that uh, a real free market for education would uh, dictate. Uh, but uh, aside from the hangover, of the elitism of the earlier era, I see very little difference between our nonprofit schools and our public universities. That became especially true after the federal government got heavily into financing, regardless of whether it was private or public. Okay, we have another question. May, may I add something to that? Absolutely. Someone's going to ask about it anyway. What, what can we expect in the future? Uh, I'd expect that uh, the, uh, the present major setup is going to get worse and worse. I don't think it's going to get any better, and abolishing tenure won't do the trick. But what ha always happens is that when you get these idiot in, uh, intrusions into freedom in the marketplace, as we've had in education for a long, long time, Often technology bails out the society, and that seems to be what's happening today. We're getting a huge number of for-profit internet-related schools. Now, <clears throat> whether or not the uh, other schools that are beginning to recognize that competition, and they're beginning to offer some online courses, uh, particularly as a way of raising revenue, that's what you want them to do. You want them to have to raise revenue. Uh, then they begin to act more rationally. Uh, I think, however, we're going to see an enormous growth in so-called distance learning. Uh, it makes so much more sense for the kind of vocational training that our universities have gotten into. You know, there used to be jokes about the courses in basket weaving, uh, but uh, they're, they're so intensely vocational that it really doesn't require anything that bears a resemblance to the old educational institutions. Okay, our next question. Why did the state schools lose their religious character when the First Amendment was not incorporated against the states until much later, the 1940s? I, I didn't hear the second part of that. I heard the first part was why did those religious schools lose their religious orientation? Right. That's right. Why did they lose their religious uh, character when the First Amendment 
was not incorporated against the states until much later in the 1940s. Oh, well, you're asking the legal history of the First Amendment, which I'm not uh, thoroughly familiar with, but it wouldn't have applied to the uh, private denominational schools. Now, <clears throat> there's an issue today that could conceivably have come up there then, but I don't know of any case, the issue that comes up with tuition vouchers, uh, with the state simply giving money to parents and letting the parents select any kind of schools, including religious schools. Well, some people have objected to that on the ground, First Amendment grounds, that that violates the separation of church and state. Uh, but there wasn't any government involvement with those schools at all. None. Zero. Nada. There was nothing. They were purely private. Uh, so that uh, the change that took place in those schools related largely to the two factors that I mentioned. One was the advent of subsidized public education, and the other was the increasing secularization of American society. Uh, there's no question that you just can't sustain a gigantic network of intensely religious schools when you don't have a very large population of intensely religious uh, well, you've got a few Catholic schools, you've got occasional Orthodox Jewish schools, um, but not many. Okay, our next question. Um, do the military academies fall under the same criteria that you have outlined for public and private schools? I must not have heard that. Uh, is, 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 I'll, I'll is the question the qu relating to the Mor Morrill Act's requirement that there be military training? Um, it is related to, the question is, do the military academies fall under the same criteria that you have outlined for public and private schools? Not exactly. That's interesting. And uh, I, you know, I'm really glad someone asked that because I had not included them in the uh, the, uh, in the writing I'm doing on this, uh, they had a mission. Like those religious schools had a religious mission, uh, like the vocational schools had a market profit maximization uh, mission, the military schools had a mission. And consequently, given their budgets, now they certainly suffered all the problems that the military always would of being uh, uh, bureaucratic and uh, uh, not having quite the sense of competitiveness that you might find in a, a so clear that everything was Midwestern schools ministers. Okay, and um, I think we'll have time for one more question. How could we have kept the positive intellectual advancement from the Morale Act without falling into faculty domination? Say that again. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't follow it. How could we have kept the positive intellectual advancement from the Morale Act without falling into faculty domination? Well, that assumes that uh, the kind of intellectual production that we do today is what the, uh, a free market would indicate. I don't think it is. Uh, last year, I, I saw a figure somewhere that I mean, it's the last 10 years, it doesn't make any difference. There were something like 300 new books written about William Shakespeare. I doubt that a fully privatized market would really show much demand for additional books about William Shakespeare. And so that aspect of, of uh, education uh, and intellectual orientation uh, was always in question from the beginning of the Morrill Act. They didn't uh, sustain a very high level of intellectual behavior. That was, for a long time, that was part of the mission uh, um, because you needed some kind of a mission statement and even the public university said it was uh, intellect, higher education, uh, research, and, and so forth. Uh, in more recent years, quite clearly, many universities, or at least many members of faculties, have taken on the social mission or maybe they call it a political mission. Uh, <laughs> which they can get away with. But the, uh, the uh, idea of intellectualism uh, 
that I think was a wonderful goal of American universities lasted from about maybe 1850s that it started with the Ivy League schools and lasted all up until about the 1950s or 60s. At that point, everything began to fall apart. Uh, uh, it will persist very strongly in areas where there is a uh, objective measure of, of uh, productivity. That's true of engineering. It's true of any of the hard sciences, biology, chemistry, physics. Uh, in those areas, one finds getting it right, uh, producing the right thing, uh, the scientifically correct answer, uh, substitutes for the old idea of intellectualism. But if you look at sociology departments, most history departments, foreign language departments, anthropology departments, the idea of uh, going out and reporting on what they find, there's very little actual, uh, I think, rational demand for their services. I think in a, a completely free market for education, you wouldn't find sociology taught in more than 10 universities in the United States. Now, you'd find specialization, but I don't think you'd find it generally. I think you'd find all the schools being much more vocational, as our public schools tend to be anyway. But they, they're, they're, they're both things. They want to be all things to all people. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think this, this idea of intellectualism was a, a wonderful goal uh, to substitute for the previous mission of religion or aristocracy, uh, but it wouldn't survive. Uh, it couldn't, given the financial and economic structure of the universities. And it's not surviving very well today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Manny, um, and to all of our participants this evening. We apologize if we couldn't get to your question, but please feel free to continue the discussions with other participants on the Facebook event. I hope you can all continue coming back to our webinars to learn more throughout the year. Our next webinar is next Wednesday, April 18th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time with Zach Walls on why liberal libertarian alliances are so important and how to build bridges to advance liberty. To register, please visit our website, studentsforliberty.org. On a final note, shortly you will receive a follow-up email where you will find more detailed information about SFL and our next webinar. You'll also receive a survey to evaluate the webinar. Please take a couple of minutes to fill it out. It helps us know how to improve our programs. And with that, I think we are officially wrapped up. Thank you again for your time this evening, and thank you, Professor Mandy, once again. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.